In 1803, the brilliant scientist John Dalton was able to prove in the lab what the ancient Greeks thousands of years earlier thought might be true, that matter was made of incredibly tiny building blocks called atoms. Dalton thought that atoms were solid spheres like billiard balls and that they were the smallest particles in the universe. But about a hundred years later, scientists discovered that atoms were made of even smaller particles. This video shows how they were able to do that. In 1897, a clever Englishman called J.J. Thompson designed a glass tube filled with low-pressure gas and containing two metal plates inside. When he put a big electric charge on the plates, he found that the positively charged plate, called the anode, was able to pull a beam of tiny particles out of the negatively charged plate, called the cathode. Because the beam came from the cathode, he called them cathode rays, and he called the apparatus a cathode ray tube. You can see the beam as a blue line in the diagram. Where the cathode rays arrived at the anode, there was a little hole that allowed them to travel through and continue and pass between a pair of parallel plates that he could put varying charges on. Sometimes the top one was positive with the bottom one negative and sometimes the other way round. The beam always bent away from whichever plate was negative and towards whichever plate was positive. This meant that the particles must have carried a negative charge because we know that like charges repel and unlike charges attract. But here's the thing. Because the beams bent so easily, more than other particles going through the plates, he could work out that they must have been very light thousands of times lighter than a hydrogen atom. Thomson realised that atoms had even smaller particles inside them and that they carried a negative charge. He had discovered the electron. He won a Nobel Prize for this. J.J. Thomson was not only a brilliant scientist, he was a really good bloke as well, and he helped many of his students become famous scientists too. Seven of them went on to win the Nobel Prize, including his own son. One of his students was Ernest Rutherford, an extroverted New Zealander with a booming voice and a big laugh. Rutherford was playing around with beams of positively charged particles, which he called alpha particles, that were emitted from uranium atoms. He knew they were positively charged because they bent in the opposite direction to the electrons of a cathode ray when passed through charged parallel plates. They bent more slowly than electrons, so he knew they were heavier than electrons too. Rutherford used these alpha particles as atomic bullets and fired them at a very thin sheet of gold that was only about a thousand atoms thick. On the opposite side to the uranium source, he placed a scintillation screen that lit up when particles hit it, so he could then measure where the alpha particles landed. If the gold atoms were like billiard balls, then the alpha particles would be blocked and none would arrive at the screen. Instead, almost all the alpha particles passed straight through the gold foil as though it wasn't there. Rutherford realised that the gold atoms were mostly empty space. J.J. Thompson thought that the mass of atoms was pretty evenly smeared out within the substance, and he also thought that most of the alpha particles would pass through. But something very surprising happened. Some of the particles were bent a few degrees off course, and about one alpha particle in 20,000 bounced right back in the direction from where it came. Rutherford said at the time that 
It was almost as incredible as if you fired a 15-inch shell at a piece of tissue paper and it came back and hit you. What this meant was that the mass of the gold was not evenly spread out at all, but concentrated in very small lumps that were positively charged. He had discovered the atom's nucleus. Because the nucleus was so small, most alpha particles didn't even come close and completely miss them. They went straight through. If some went close to the nucleus, its positive charge would cause repulsion and bend them off course. If an alpha particle made an occasional direct hit, it would bounce right back from where it came because the nucleus was much, much heavier than the alpha particle itself. The nucleus is incredibly heavy. Over 99% of the atom's weight is concentrated there and incredibly small. If we magnified an atom to be the size of a football stadium, the nucleus would be the size of a pea. Rutherford later discovered a particle inside the nucleus that was responsible for its positive charge, and he called it the proton. An atom's overall nuclear charge was equal to the number of protons it had in its nucleus. And this also turned out to be the same as the atom's atomic number. Each element had its own number of protons in its nucleus. How's that for a coincidence? But there was puzzling evidence that the nucleus was heavier than could be accounted for by protons alone. Scientists could measure the weight of protons, and they knew how many protons were in the nucleus of each kind of atom. But when they measured the overall mass of these nuclei, they were usually about double the mass of all the protons put together. Was there another particle in the nucleus? In 1932, James Chadwick, a student of Rutherford's, discovered a beam of new particles with about the same mass as protons. He did this by shooting alpha particles into beryllium atoms and knocking these particles out of the beryllium nuclei. The beryllium target was much thicker than Rutherford's gold foil, so there were many more nuclei for the alpha particles to make direct hits with. Beryllium's nuclei has an atomic number of four, so he knew that they had four protons each, but he was experimenting to find a new particle in the nucleus. When these particles were struck by the alpha particle bullets, they were knocked out of the nucleus and then continued in a beam that Chadwick could study. This beam did not bend when passed through charged parallel plates, like the electrons of Thomson's experiment did. Remember it was the electron's negative charge that made them bend when going through the plates. This meant that the newly discovered particles had no charge. Because these particles were electrically neutral, he named them neutrons. Chadwick had an eventful life. During World War I he was a prisoner of war in Europe and he even did a lot of his experiments while he was a prisoner. Then during World War II he helped invent the atomic bomb in America. By now scientists had a fuller picture of how atoms were made. They had a nucleus consisting of positively charged protons and neutral neutrons at their centre and this was responsible for most of their mass. Light, negatively charged electrons whizzed around the outside of the nuclei, in fact at about three quarters of the speed of light, and gave atoms most of their size. The question of how atoms could stick together was also answered. Having an opposite charge to the nucleus, electrons are attracted to it, so the electric forces can hold electrons travelling at near the speed of light 
and bend them into an orbit around the nucleus. Electric forces act as a kind of atomic glue holding atoms together. They are quadrillions of quadrillions of times stronger than gravity. For those of you who have learnt about the powers of 10 way of writing numbers, electric forces are 10 to the power of 33 times more powerful than gravity. That's one with 33 zeros. In the next video called Atomic Structure, we will look at how electrons are wrapped around the nucleus in shells and how this dictates the properties of atoms. For example, whether they will be a gas, liquid or solid, or their colour or brittleness, or whether they will be a metal or a non-metal. Pretty much everything.